a very warm good afternoon to all of you on behalf of net zero alliance india and first view group i sakshi extend a warm welcome to each and every one of you at the webinar on green open access for manufacturing industries and corporates it is my pleasure to be here as your host we would like to extend our gratitude to our esteemed guest speakers and the attendees for their valuable presence in today's webinar your active participation has contributed in making this event truly remarkable in the face of pressing environmental challenges we all are aware from climate change to resource depletion the imperative for corporations to adopt sustainable practices has never been more critical our focus today revolves around two pivotal aspects the concept of green open access in manufacturing and the strategies that can lead corporation towards achieving net zero emissions the net zero leadership talk series which is a first of its kind will redefine the future inspire sustainability and create a lasting impact for generations to come before we proceed i would like to make a brief announcement for our attendees here we in this by posting in their questions in the q and a our esteemed panel of speakers will address these questions during the interactive q and a session once we conclude the panel discussion now without any further ado let us initiate our highly anticipated panel discussion session for today it is my pleasure to introduce our esteemed panel of experts who will share their insights and expertise on the topic at hand we have with us today mr ak saxena from teddy mr subendu mukherji from nldc grid controller of india uh, dr sunita purushottam from mahindra life space developers mr rajan varshney from ntpc limited and mr pc tiwari from ajmer vidyut vitran nigam Mr. A K Saxena will be the moderator for the session. Uh, Mr. Saxena currently heads the Electricity and Renewable Division in the Energy and Resources Institute. He has over forty years of experience in the power sector in India. He has worked with P E A, M N R E, and Central Electricity uh, Resource uh, Regulatory Commission. Post retirement from government service in twenty sixteen. He is with Cherry, where he leads various projects in the power sector. Key areas of focus of his work at present include energy transition, just transition, smart distribution with energy storage, e-mobility, demand side management, smart grid, cross-body electricity, trade, etc., which involve a strong interaction with the power utilities in the country, as well as leading organizations, institutes. In in india and other countries i would now request mr saxena to take the discussion so. thank you so much uh, sakshi it's my pleasure and privilege to be uh, in a panel discussion on a topic which is extremely important and i extend a very warm welcome to my fellow panelists i see engineer prahlad tiwari my colleague subendu mrs dr sunita purushottam i am sure she must have joined by now or she might be joining and mr rajan varshney will also join in due course i am also given to understand our colleague from the ca is also joining the panel discussion i give a very warm welcome extend a very warm welcome to all of them now the background for the session and the panel discussion has been very well laid by sonia 
the open access was one of the noteworthy inclusion in the electricity act 2003 and over the years lot prog lot of progress has been made in the open access but now we find that we are at a stage where green energy open access is the new requirement and a lot of work has been done in regard to this now why is it important i think we all very well know that india's commitment to the climate change and the climate action is very steadfast at cop 26 our honorable prime minister made a commitment in regard to the achieving the installed generation capacity of the order of 50% from the non fossil fuel sources the reduction of emissions intensity of the economy by about 40 to 45% as compared to 2005 levels and these two targets were the shorter term targets these were to be achieved by the year 2030 the honorable prime minister also announced a longer term target which is achieving net zero by 2070 and thereafter india has communicated its updated ndcs to unfccc and various initiatives are being taken in order to move forward with the the required degree of intensity and acceleration among various initiatives taken by the government of india not only on the generation side to include as much of non fossil fuel capacity as is possible to meet the desired target there are also initiatives on the transmission side like waiver of transmission charges etc and also initiatives in order to the consumers to get the green energy from various sources now the rules which were made by the ministry of power in 2022 thereafter there has been an amendment in 2023 the procedure for green energy open access has also been specified in july 2023 and the grid control of india is the central nodal agency for green energy open access now apart from all these initiatives some of the states have also made the green energy open access regulations the haryana karnataka west bengal to name a few i think uh, in this backdrop we are here to discuss that what has been the sort of a story and journey of green energy open access so far what is the learning and how do we try to move forward so that the best possible use of these rules and the regulations being made can be there so i think in this backdrop i would now like to first request my colleague shubhendu from the grid country ruler of india who as the central nodal agency would give a very holistic uh, picture for the benefit of all who are attending this webinar and thereafter the key issues and challenges which he finds it today and what is being done in order to address them that will be extremely helpful so over to you shubhendu thank you thank you sir so i thank the organizer for uh, giving me this opportunity to have this discussion over here so as already uh, saksana sir has already told that this green energy is a topic of the present time and because we have certain target to follow given by our honorable prime ministers so this is the field where we would like to move ahead and uh, india is the only country where uh, there are se several products that have been designed specially for the green energy like uh, green energy you will find a separate market segment green dehed market and then you also have a, a bilateral market where in green tamahed market so this is a special thing or or a, a special
special market segment you will find on only in the india only so ministry of power has come up with this uh, rules in 2022 uh, for providing the uh, access to the small consumer uh, for this green power so the rule came up with a capacity of 100 kilowatt so earlier we used to see that consumers for more than 1 megawatt are getting open access and they are taking conventional and also the non conventional power but through this rule a pathway has been made for the consumer who is having a capacity of up to 100 kilowatt later on uh, also on ministry of power has come up with a, a new segment of consumers those who were less than 100 kilowatt but in one electrical division collectively they can have a demand of 100 kilowatt say for example there are certain transmission uh, te uh, telecom towers those who are situated in a single distribution area or single division of electricity and individually they may be having a capacity of less than 100 kilowatt whereas collectively they could have a capacity of 100 kilowatt or more so they could have get this uh, green energy from the green energy power plants so this is also a new thing that has come up through these rules and then uh, as because our in, in india electricity is a concurrent subject and we have a central electricity commission uh, for the central rules and regulations as well as we have a state regulatory commissions uh, for the state regulations to have a harmonized views so that the consumers those who are situated in the states could get the access of green energy open access or green power through forum of regulator a uh, common regulation has been formed and as sir has already told that lot of uh, states regulatory commission has come up with a draft or a final green energy open access regulations there are more than 15 to 16 regulatory commissions in state they have come up with the green energy open access regulations more or less those regulations are aligned with the rules that has been formed by ministry of power in these rules national load dispatch center is given the responsibility to be the nodal agency and also a single window portal provider what we have made we have made a green energy open access portal wherein the consumer the generator can get registered there the open access could be happy they can apply in open access to the portal for the interstate and intrastate so if the open access consumer and the generator is situated within a state so that can also happen and the interstate transaction could take place through this portal so presently uh, punjab and himachal pradesh both states are doing the interstate transaction the green transaction through this portal this portal has been made live in uh, november 2022 since then, all the green energy open access industry transactions are being done through this portal only. More than 20,000 applications has come till then. And more than 14 billion units power transaction has happened till then through this portal. The advantage of these green energy rules are, one of the advantage is that there will be a single point of contact, single portal, single system where you can apply you can track the application your approval will be made and then you can pay for that through this portal also this portal also comes up with the payment gateway providing service provider of uh, big bank banks so they can you can pay your open access charges to this portal as well as the advantage of these rules are that green power has been given a priority over the conventional power transactions now when we talk about the priority the priority means that if there is a transmission constraint or in any uh, corridor green power will be having a priority over that so in these rules the applications are being processed in first come first serve basis also honorable crs has come up with a regulation general network access through which the temporary general network access transactions are happening 
and in there also the first come first serve rule has been yeah, applied since 1st October 2023. Now, uh, through this uh, implementation of the rule, the arbitration has also become uh, very much easier because if any authority deny denies uh, the open access to the consumer so there are a uh, lot of uh, earlier litigations now what is happening that through this rule nobody can deny the open access and nobody can uh, no authority can uh, deny without any reason so he has to give one reason and there would be a hearing for denial of the open access and then the action will be taken and if there is a denial so in that case what will happen that uh, there is a appeal can, can be made and there is a 30 days appeal period given now the appropriate commission will be disposing the appeal within three months so each and every timeline has been given so timeline is not only given to the nodal agency timeline has also been given to the honorable commissions now for this green energy open access the interstate transactions the short term transactions the temporary gna transactions nodal agencies are the regional load dispatch centers so we have five regions so there are five regional load dispatch centers and if the transaction is taking place within the state the state load dispatch center is the nodal agency and for the long term or a gna transactions central transmission utility in the interstate and state transmission utility in the interstate. So these are the nodal agents. So when an applicant is applying for the green energy open access, maybe for a long term, short term, any period. So this portal will automatically send this application to the nodal agencies that is responsible for providing the approval. Each and application is having timestamp and each and every activity that is being done in this portal is timestamp and the other entity can see the activity being done by the nodal agency. So you can, through this uh, process, audit trail has been generated and you can track your applications. So that is very much uh, important. Now the main uh, benefit of this uh, Green Energy Open Access Registry is that this uh, has been helping for the growth in the renewable power. It is all also helping for enhancement of the competition because the consumer is having a lot of choice. So where, when there is a choice, there is competitions. It is also helping for streamline the state specific regulations because states to state the regulation varies, but through a forum of regulator, the model regulations are being formed under these rules and the regulations which, is, which are being formed by the honorable state commissions are nearly harmonized but there is a uniform renewable power obligations uh, been guideline been provided by ministry of power so that is uniform for the level of users and if someone some users want to have uh, cater the renewable power obligation he can cater through this uh, green energy open access rules now this green energy open access portal is a single window portal. So when we talk about a single window portal, it means that starting from the registration to the approval, you don't have to take your, you don't have to go to any other portal. You don't have to place your application, physical applications, everything is online. And each and every activities are being tracked. Each and activities are being um, intimated through emails, through SMS. So there is also a MIS reporting system wherein you can see that how the reports, uh, how much transactions are being done and which are the entities those who are doing the transactions. And there are being a seamless integration uh, with all the entities like the state load dispatch centers are having its own application in own software. So those software could be integrated. So these are the uh, main features and uh, special uh, SLDC SQs, those are being given the dashboard facilities over here and they can track the application being made to them. And uh, there is an open connections through API integrations so through these applications are being done. So 
you can see that this is one stop solutions and uh, as per the rules is concerned it is also helping for the entities to cater their renewal power obligations so uh, that's uh, that is the brief i would like to mention it's over to you sir saksana sir thank you so much thank you to bendu i think uh, thanks a lot for giving a very comprehensive overview of the evolution of green energy open access rules and the regulations which are there and what all the grid controller of india has done as a central nodal agency for facilitating this and we are very happy to note the initiatives and the volume which has been there so far also i am very happy to note that uh, the intra state green energy open access is also on the move two of the states punjab and himachal you told about it's a very very encouraging sign and i think what we need that more and more awareness is created about these rules and the regulations are framed in consonance with the model regulations which are there and then i think a lot of progress can be there and india as an entity as a country we can sort of a move fast in achieving the ambitious targets we have in this regard now we will come back to you suvendu and other panelists if we have time but right now for the time being i would uh, i find that uh, dr sunita purushottam has joined and dr sunita is from the mahindra life spaces and she brings a she is the head of the sustainability and she brings a lot of experience in regard to uh, the uh, as a consumer how do they see that what best they can make use of in achieving the net zero targets so i think we know in india apart from the state owned entity entities a number of corporates have set their net zero targets and i am very happy to note that many of those corporates have the net zero targets of starting from 2035 2040 and so on so i think uh, in this is my view that the corporates will show the way to the country as a whole that how we can accelerate our journey to the achieving net zero targets as a country as a whole so dr sunita very warm welcome to you my i would request you to give your impressions about it but i would be very happy if you can touch upon two points one in general how do you see the role of open access in net zero strategies and number two what challenges do you see for a real estate sector as a large consumer and along with those challenges we would be very happy if you spell out the sort of a way forward how best to meet those challenges so that the concerned authorities can take note of it and as an outcome of this uh, event i think we have certain actionable points to address the challenges so over to you dr sunita thank you so much and uh, thanks uh, uh, to the organizers here uh, the india net zero alliance and uh, for uh, you know taking up this important topic and uh, first of all i would like to share with the audience uh, about the business what kind of business we are in then i will talk about the targets uh, then uh, you know the role of open access in uh, meeting our net zero goals then uh, i will come to the challenges so i'll structure it that way uh, we at mahindra life spaces we are the real estate uh, arm of uh, mahindra and mahindra we are looking at two businesses one is integrated cities and industrial clusters and the other one is the residential uh, buildings right so these these are distinct businesses our city business gets us revenues our uh, residential business i mean uh, it gets us onm revenues let me put it that way the operational maintenance because we are almost like a municipality uh, over there 
so uh, we have a ongoing revenue model so uh, our uh, daily bread is our city and our aspirational part is uh, the residential and residential is where the growth levers are um, cities will get um, developed and it will give us a stable income but the residential part is the one which is fueling our growth strategy and we have to decarbonize both right and uh, we have net zero uh, target of going to net zero by 2040 on our scope 1 and scope 2 and uh, and some part on our scope 3 already one of our cities world city chennai has become uh, has achieved, achieved its science based targets we have not yet become uh, carbon neutral over there um, we are looking at various ways of reducing uh, completely decarbonizing instead of doing going for offsets or anything else uh, World City Jaipur is a C40 city that is carbon positive development and there already there is a open access uh, kind of an agreement uh, which helps us maintain this at carbon, uh, uh, carbon positivity, right? However, that uh, with increased number of customers and Jaipur is 50% uh, developed or 60% developed, 40% of development as it happens and new industries uh, uh, come into the city. So these are industrial clusters and integrated cities. And so basically we lease out land and the industries come in. And uh, the industries themselves also have to decarbonize. And this is where the open access becomes very, very, very relevant for us. And I think a lot of socializing is required for our industrial customers and corporates who are part of this city because ultimately their goals and their uh, meeting their um, uh, you know carbon neutrality targets. If they have none, they have to take. If they uh, have taken, then they have to uh, get to it, right? Uh, decarbonize their operations, and uh, that is where this open access thing is extremely beneficial for our large format uh, developments. It will help us uh, push the pedal on uh, even uh, getting our customers to embrace uh, their net zero roadmap. So not all customers have net zero roadmap. Now, one can often argue that, uh, you know, it is not in your purview and therefore why are you looking at customers, right? Uh, so the we, we the inventory is full. So it's uh, I mean it's holistic. So as a part of our scope three, the customer emissions comes into the picture, and it is a huge portion of the uh, scope three. Uh, scope one and scope two are very less. Scope three for customers is extremely high, and therefore we are interested deeply interested in uh, for our customers also to embrace zero waste to landfill, water positivity, and uh, net zero uh, targets for energy as well. So that's where it will help us. On the residential side of the story, um, we have a carbon neutrality journey, of course, scope one, scope two, and of course, a large part of it is the scope three, which is the uh, building itself, right? And for buildings, we have taken net zero energy waste water targets. We are finding it extremely um, so net zero energy target, what we have done uh, for uh, two of our projects. So we launched India's first net zero energy project. We have launched another one in Bombay and another one in, uh, so two in Bangalore and the third one in Bangalore. So all high rise residential net zero energy projects are Mahindra, uh, IGBC certified are uh, Mahindra products. Now um, we of course cannot do uh, complete on site. It is not possible because these are the amount of land that is required for us to do on site uh, is uh, very limited. So, what we do is we uh, design the buildings for uh, cross ventilation, shading of the windows, uh, high performance glass, uh, wall to window ratio. These are the different elements that we look at for uh, reducing the energy demand because without reducing the energy demand, we must not move towards renewable energy. So we work on the design first, then energy efficiency of the appliances, and then on site, and then uh, we look for what we can get from the grid. Now here, uh, we have had a policy challenge, and I'm coming to the challenge piece now. Um, we know that every person who asks for green power should get green power. And that's what uh, uh, Mr. Saxena also uh, mentioned. So, uh, but the challenge was that our customers are LT customers, not HT customers. And in HT customers, you can get green power, but in LT customers, you can't. 
fortunately the uh, there was a central ruling there was a circ ruling on ht and lt uh, sorry on uh, uh, on there was a circ ruling on this and uh, uh every electricity board or authority regulatory authority had to toe the line and with a lot of push and policy advocacy we went to the karnataka uh, krc and we got that order to be passed uh the project was launched in april 2022 and i had i was carrying the resignation my resignation in the in my pocket because i, I had launched it and it's got gone to the customers and what if uh, the ruling didn't come finally 23rd of uh, 2023 27th september i remember the date the letter comes in the order is passed and we did uh, three levels of advocacy we went via the group corporate affairs route we went directly uh, as well uh, with the representation letters we inverted the letters met them and the third we went via the international institute of energy conservation and they were the ones actually who helped us craft these uh, products okay uh, i mean product as in the buildings uh, in terms of the value proposition of integrating renewable into the mix so that's how we are able to get it at lt now there are certain locations where the grid power is still not available for example while uh, there is a ruling and uh, we have met the authorities uh, msc dcl that is in pune maharashtra state uh, electricity commission we have made a requisition but now suppose this doesn't happen then we'll have to go via the open access route so we have given a representation over there to get um, uh, to get the power uh, uh, through the grid itself through the state uh, discom so in bangalore also we went via biscom which is bescom which is the bangalore electricity uh, uh, distribution company uh, here also we are going with the maharashtra state uh, distribution company so th this is what we are planning to do uh, the challenge is for now suppose if the state authorities don't give us the power at lt right it could happen that it is not possible or whatever uh then the open access route is the other option or the uh, last option is the irec okay i wouldn't go via i wouldn't want to go via this route because ultimately it is how the billing should happen and as a developer we don't want to um, manage the bills of our customers so each housing society 800 apartments it is i mean bare minimum 800 apartments it's a nightmare to manage electricity bills so we'll uh, ultimately become the <laughs> we don't want to do that so we want it to happen via the route uh, and it should come from the state uh, electric or whatever discoms that are available for us uh, the other thing that i wanted to touch upon is as a company we also do we, we do construction right so we have our uh, uh, scope one and scope two targets on the construction right and for that we need uh, for temporary lines we need uh, green power and how can we do that how what kind of mechanism so i i still have a lot of questions that is the if so we will try and minimize the emissions or uh, diesel consumption then the electricity consumption uh, do on site uh, renewable energy some sites we it is not possible to do on site renewable energy it's a temporary site temporary office it is some tent i won't be able to do renewable energy so that's one challenge so how do we how do i get to the construction power can i uh, can, uh, because these are temporary connections and then how do we work on the open access for uh, you know sites activities such as this now one has to bear in mind that construction sector has to be factored because if the construction sector is not factored the entire global budget of 90 gigat or billion tons or gigatons that india has will be consumed by the construction sector itself so that is the challenge of the construction sector and we really need our policies and regulations and uh, movement around Uh, this this aspect that how do we how do we decarbonize the uh, act the actual act of construction right so i'll pause here so much thank you so much dr sunita i think uh, very very sort of a important points you made and number 2 i think many who are there online on to this would not know about all this so i think it is very informative certainly it is very informative for me i think i have learnt a lot from your sort of a the work you people are doing 
and i'm very happy to note that uh, holistically you are looking at all the emissions not only scope 1 scope 2 but also scope 3 and not only in your regular activities but also in a temporary construction work sort of thing also where the power connection is required for a very limited period and i think it is a very very heartening to note that such initiatives are being taken and i think i'm sure these issues will be flagged and they will be discussed and deliberated with greater amount of focus and intensity and i think solutions will be formed because I, we believe that there is no problem which does not have a solution every problem has a solution it's only we have to find a way that how do we sort of a uh, structure our problem and then go on to finding out the solutions with the right stakeholders and right authorities thank you so much i think we will come back to you if the time permits thank uh, you thank you so much now may i now request uh, our colleague from the ajmer uh, dixcom engineer prahlad tiwari uh, to be giving his thoughts about the green energy open access i understand as a dixcom the or as a state or the state electricity regulatory commission i think the regulations are yet to come and take a final shape but i think uh, the learning or the understanding which you have got uh, from the other regulations which are there or the consumers who are wanting to have green energy open access so i think uh, your thoughts will be extremely important because the distribution companies have an extremely important role in the green energy open access so over to you uh, mr pehlad tiwari thank you sir for allowing me to uh, discuss on the important issue green energy open access uh, and uh, the issues related to discoms so uh, in context to green energy open access uh, uh, facilitating open access discom play a critical role in facilitating open access to green energy by providing the necessary infrastructure and regulatory framework for consumers to procure renewable energy directly from generators they manage the distribution network through which renewable energy is transmitted to consumers opting for open access so discom are responsible for managing the integration of renewable energy into the grid ensuring grid stability and maintaining system reliability this involves coordinating the fluctuating generation from renewable sources like solar and wind with the demand from the consumers so tariff and pricing structures uh, uh, for that discoms are responsible for setting the tariff structure including charges associated with the open access and renewable energy procurement they need to develop pricing mechanism that encourage the uptake of renewable energy while ensuring the financial sustainability of the grid so discoms can support the development of renewable energy projects with their distribution areas uh, by entering into power purchase agreements with renewable energy developers they can also facilitate the connection of renewable energy projects to the grid and provide technical assistance to renewable energy developers discom administer the net metering and feed in tariff programs which allow consumers to offset their electricity consumption with self generated renewable energy or sell excess energy back to the grid the discom need to ensure fair compensation for distributed renewable energy generation while maintaining the grid stability then again discom play a crucial role in educating consumers about the benefits of renewable energy and open access options they can provide information on available green energy tariffs net metering policies and the process for opting for open access helping consumers make informed decisions investing in green uh, smart grid technologies uh, the discoms are is increasingly investing in smart grid technologies to enhance grid flexibility improve demand side management and integrate uh, integrate the renewable energy more effectively this uh, includes deploying advanced metering infrastructure grid automation system and energy storage solution so right now rajasthan discoms are uh, uh, having a tender for ami uh, sp that is advanced metering infrastructure which will add the uh, consumer meters uh we replace the all the existing consumer meters be with the 
smart uh, energy smart meters uh, having prepaid facility right so then if we talk about the uh, policy advocacy and regulatory compliance then discom engage in policy advocacy and regulatory compliance activities to ensure that regulatory framework support the integration of renewable energy and open access they work closely with regulatory authorities to address challenges and streamline processes related to green energy procurement then uh, uh, the overall the evolving role of discom in green energy open access involves trans transitioning from traditional electricity distribution models to more flexible dynamic and sustainable approaches that support the integration of renewable energy and meet the evolving needs of consumers and the energy transition towards a low carbon future so in uh, to adapt to the changing landscape of green energy open access and meet the growing demand of renewable energy uh, the, the, there are various ways that uh, implementing the smart grid technologies enhance uh, the capability of discoms to improve grid stability liability and optimize grid energy distribution and integrate renewable energy sources so this is basically a very big problem that uh, this renewable energy sources you know are very you know kind of uh, uh they de they depends on the you know uh, the clouds and etc so say for, for solar and wind we see if there is a sun then there is there is energy generated or if there is a no wind no energy generated no solar there is cloud instantly the power generated is off so the grid stability is a major challenge in this uh, in this area so discom has to do more about this uh, grid stability then the uh, to apply the advanced uh, this uh, distributed energy resource management system to optimize the operation of distributed energy resources such as rooftop solar panels energy storage systems and electric vehicle charging stations the system help balance supply and demand in real time and maximize the utilization of renewable energy so again the we talk about the uh, energy storage solutions then to deploy the energy storage system such as batteries and pump pumped hydro storage to store excess renewable energy and provide grid stability during periods of fluctuating generation energy storage solutions enable discoms to mitigate the variable t of renewable energy sources and enhance grid resilience so there are various you know charges uh, in uh, specified in this regulation if uh, some uh, consumer needs to have the grid energy open access Uh, as the subandhu ji said told that a consumer having 100 kilowatt in individually or in totality within a division of the discom can go for open access uh, some states have already issued the regulations uh, but uh, rajasthan uh, i think has to uh, yet to uh, finalize the uh, draft regulations for the green energy open access and we expect that soon the rrc will uh, release the the regulations for this green energy open access so these various charges are is defined in this uh, regulation are the transmission charges related to related to the interstate and intrastate uh, uh, losses on the in the transmission lines so if uh, if consumer uh, so this basically this is a kind of fixed charges but, but it should i think it if it is uh, it depends on the the the, the distance uh distance or length of the transit line being utilized for particular consumer then uh, the the it will be very attractive option otherwise all the consumers will get will have the same kind of transit charge it is not justified then if we talk about billing charges these are second kind of charges we do utilize uh, used in this uh, green energy open access and this uh, this uh, billing billing charges if we talk about basically are the uh, charges the distribution system and associated facilities of transmission licensee or distribution licensee as the case may be are used by another person for the convenience of convenience of electricity on payment of charges determined under section uh, 62 of the electricity act then the, the the standby charges means the charges applicable to green energy op open access consumers against the standby arrangement provided by the distribution licensee in such case green energy open access consumer is unable to procure or schedule the power from the generating sources with whom they have the agreement to procure power due to outage of generator or transmission systems and the like so these are the uh, charges then cross subsidy charges are there then uh, banking charges are there and other fees and charges such as 
this uh, state uh, level load display center uh, ld charges we say and fees and schedule charge then division settlement uh, charges uh, and uh, as per the relevant regulation of the commission so different commission will uh, will uh, frame the uh, tariff for the green energy open access and that will decide the uh, these charges for particular uh, discom right uh, particular state by say so uh, these are charges are to be uh, defined in the regulations to be notified by the uh, state electricity regulatory commissions so some states have already notified as the subandhu ji this sakshana ji told at west bengal and some karnataka like that they have already issued such regulations and uh, i i i expect that rajasthan and gujarat will also issue the the these regulations shortly so if we talk about the uh, the net achieving the net zero emissions in the uh, in the manufacturing industry and corporations then basically it uh, to uh, to get the net zero emission it uh, not only this open access will help but it requires also the a comprehensive strategy that involve the various aspects of operations including energy consumption sub, uh, the supply chain management waste management and more so uh, basically in in order to achieve the net zero emissions by, by these industries and various corporations they have to establish clear and ambitious targets for achieving net zero emissions uh, this which involves the specific timelines and metrics to track the the progress then uh, uh, the, the corporation also have to invest in energy efficient technologies and practices to reduce the energy consumption in operations this include the upgrading the equipment optimizing processes and implementing the smart building systems then transition to renewable energy sources such as solar wind and hydro power to meet energy needs this can involve the installing on site renewable energy systems or purchasing the renewable energy from off site sources through green energy open access right then uh, again the offsetting the unavoidable emissions by investing in carbon offset projects like the reforestation then renewable energy projects or the methane capturing uh, initiatives again the, the the they have to work with suppliers to reduce emissions throughout the the supply chain this involve the source material loyalty uh, locally optimizing the transportation routes routes and encouraging the suppliers to adopt the uh, the new sustainable practices then adopt a circular economy approach to minimize the waste and maximize the resource efficiency then again the they have to engage the employees in sustainability initiatives and empower them to contribute to reduce emissions uh, this includes in training setting up green teams and incentivize sustainable behavior then they have to implement the robust monitoring and reporting systems to track emission across the organization uh, then the advocate the uh, advocate for supporting policies at their uh, the local national and international levels to enable the transition to a low carbon economy Uh, this includes may include the uh, carbon pricing mechanism renewable energy incentives and regulations to to limit the emissions uh, so these are the some uh, uh, activities strategies that uh, industry manufacturing industry or some corporation has to to adopt to reduce the uh, the uh, to net zero to achieve the net zero emissions set by the uh, government so that's uh, from my side thank you thank you so much uh, uh, mr tiwari for giving a very comprehensive sort of overview of the important role which the distribution company plays and what all it is doing and what all challenges are there before it the work being done in regard to the spot distribution the metering etc i think it is all essential prerequisite for the type of work which is required to be done in the times to come and i think your suggestions are sort of a really welcome for the manufacturing and corporate sector what you have told about i think a lot of things you told about which need to be done holistically lot many industries and corporates might be doing it and lot many would take note of this to be doing it further so thank you so much and we will see whether we come back to you in the form of questions as they are there i see one or two in the chat box which are there 
So I think uh, let me try to find out is uh, Mr. Rajan Varshne there right now? Has he been able to join? I think I was told that he was in some other engagement and he was to join. Not yet, sir. Okay, then. So time. then, Vaishali, then could we then go for a question answer? Are there the questions in the chat box? If you be no, are right. able to put it through to the concerned speakers, it will be really helpful. Sure, I'll just screen in the questions. This question is for uh, Ms. Chitibari. Ms. Chitibari, you are able to read it. Uh, question for Blasar. Is there a need to examine the... Yes, yes, definitely, definitely. We have to basically whenever the state uh, elected regulatory commission issues the draft regulations and is it is open for discussion with the different forums. They discuss the the the, the issues with the different stakeholders with the state different. Then you have to involve yourself uh, within your state. Uh, which state? Uh, I think the Agarwal form. I, 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 it is not clear. But if whenever there is a there is a regulation being issued from your state elected regulatory commission. Then you should be. Uh, you should discuss. You should. You can. You can give your own uh, arguments on the, the 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 tariff which is decided by the uh, which, which is drafted by the state electability commission. And uh, definitely, uh, we have to uh, we have to tell the uh, SCRC that that the charges should be justified technically and you know must be such that uh, it it promotes the renewable energy open access. If the charges are so high. If it is then, then there will be uh, rarely some consumers will be try for this renewable energy open access, green energy open access. So yeah, I think. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Tiwari. I think Sakshi, we could take the next question. To Sunita. Dr. Sunita, there is a question. <laughs> yeah, just a minute. Sorry. Can I see the full question? What is your view on this? Also, would you support IREX to? I want to see the full question. It says, would you support IREX to become green power for your clients and Mahindra Group? Okay, so <laughs> the SBTI I think came in as a shock because I'm part of the technical advisory committee group to the two science-based targets. So we have actually given them a hard time saying that we are questioning it. Okay, so with that, you can understand uh, that I definitely am of, not of the opinion that we should use offsets. Offsets is the last part. And in fact, you shouldn't. You shouldn't actually uh, go for offsets in the first place. Why? Because uh, uh, otherwise you will never end up uh, decarbonizing. So if you give, uh, if you want true decarbonizing and decarbonization and as well as reap the benefits of decarbonization from a company's perspective, um, we must look at ways of actually working on uh, this approach, which is called as AMG. AMG is nothing but avoid, minimize, and then generate. Uh, it may become difficult uh, to do it for scope three, but that's where hard decisions have to be taken on scope three strategies, on the product, on, uh, you know, on uh, make, say, say for example, I make soap and uh, I say that, uh, you know, the product distribution is not part of my uh, strategies. It has to be part of my strategies uh, and so on and so forth. So you cannot um, delink your decarbonization efforts and uh, take the carbon offset route. 
SBTI earlier had uh, said that carbon offsets are not allowed. Okay, allowing corporates to use carbon offsets, then it must come with the caveat that you have to do the reductions as per the science-based target, uh, whether it is an uh, absolute or intensity target, you must do those reductions after which you can do offsets. And that's the stand that SBTI should take. So that's my view on this. And uh, supporting IREX uh, for certain portions of decarbonizing, yes, but not without doing AMG. AMG is important. Otherwise, it will become OMG. Okay. And once you will start seeing that anything that humans do are potentially damaging in nature, say, for example, even the solar or the wind, they also have their own carbon footprint. So they are also, uh, they have a, uh, you know, uh, their own footprint. It's manufacturing at the end of the day, whether it is a Suzlon or whether it is a Mahindra Sustain. Uh, we have a solarized business, Mahindra Sustain, Mahindra Solarize. Uh, which caters, one caters to open access, the other caters to on-site rooftop solar. It has a carbon footprint, right? And therefore, AMG is the approach to go. And uh, one must use both offsets and IREX with a lot of care. It's a responsible use of these measures, okay? Otherwise, anybody can do anything. So that's my thought on this. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Sunita. Thanks a lot. Uh, so, Sakshi, do we have the next question now? Yeah, so yeah, let me let me answer this question. So uh, yeah. we have a portal, uh, yeah. So we have a portal, uh, greenopenaccess.in. So if you could kindly uh, type that uh, link in the Google, you'll find one portal. So therein you have to first get registered with the portal. Registration is free of cost. There you have to put just basic data like your user ID, your password you would like to make, then your uh, mobile number, email IDs, the address etc and after that you put as a consumer you put your data over there like uh, what is your demand where you are situated what is your discom what is your state slc's like those one those are simple things and uh, major things you will get a pop-up over there and then uh, after in between if you need any help uh, there is a 24 into 7 helpline available there is a 24 into 7 uh, uh, you customer support we have. There is a mail. If you could go through the uh, website, you will see there is a mail. So if you write anything in the mail, in this mail, you will get a response within five minutes. So our organization has a SLA with the provider. Within five minutes, they will respond to your mail. So this sort of... Uh, help we can do and uh, obviously we are there at NLDC and also in RLDC so any anything you require from our side we'll certainly do that. Thank you. Thank you Shubindu. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Sakshi are you bringing up the next question? It's there. I can take that, uh, Sakshi. Yeah, please, please. Yeah. So, discoms have to give green electricity, and that's what the central, uh, uh, that's what CERC says. Okay, but provided they have the wherewithal to uh, have sufficient uh, generation happening, so the CERC regulation says that if a consumer asks for green power, they should be able to get it. Okay, from the regular discoms. So. Already, uh, private discoms such as Adani and Tata are offering it. Bescom is now offering it at our inst insistence. They are offering it. So, um, 
that ability of discoms to account for a portion of their green electricity as well as increased demand for uh, green electricity by end consumers will actually see many discoms giving green electricity in their program it will come in the bills they offer that in uh, abroad also and here also it has become something a trend it can become a trend thank you thank you so much next question please sakshi Shubhendu, could you please uh, address this question? Is it the is the is it that it should be at least thirty percent of the total consumption? Yeah. So uh, I think uh, in the rule it is mentioned that it is at least thirty percent of the total monthly consumption. I think not a billing period. Anyway, if you are taking billing period as a monthly basis, so it is at least thirty uh, percent mentioned in the rule. Uh, the reason behind this is that uh, when we are going for a banking if your consumption is not a is not is not a up to a mark so it is very much difficult for the discom also to make the banking as well as to keep all the accounting and when there are certain technical transmission and distribution losses also so if a small quantum is been banked uh, in the discom and when it gives back that same amount of energy to the consumers so a lot of uh, energy will be wiped out for the transmission losses distribution losses so it is mentioned at least 30% and uh, not as quantum lesser than that thank you so much for clarifying the basis of the threshold what has been kept as thank you so much sakshi next question please so uh, would uh, mr tiwari would you like to answer or to window would you like to answer for the power to small industrial companies yeah sir actually uh, uh, if a consumer or company is small industrial companies so that that credit rating actually does not have in such a big impact mm -hmm. on the procurement of green energy open access because green energy open access if you are procuring uh, from the renewable energy power plants so you have a letter of credits or a payment security mechanism back to back with that so maybe a bank guarantee maybe a letter of credit is there in the power purchase agreement through that uh, you can purchase power uh, from the renewable plant it is relevant that how much credit rating or low credit rating you are having uh, that can be done through a proper payment security mechanism between buyer and seller yeah thank you thank you so much vindu Sakshi, do we have further questions? Is some question to Sivindu? I cannot read it well. There is one question to Dr. Sunita. Yeah, uh, Sakshi, just uh, scroll it down a little bit. But they are signing PPA with. वो नीचे जाना पड़ेगा आपको पूरा क्वेश्चन देखना. भाड़ा फॉर द वायर्स okay and with time they will when people will realize it uh this will also come at a cheaper rate than coal okay so i'm just waiting for this transformation to happen more information about this needs to be gathered 
for example uh, merk who are they who have they uh, maharashtra who have they signed ppa with in order to do that similarly karnataka what are these ppa costs okay the uh, the uh, the per kilowatt or the charges and so on what is the charges structure and what are you basing the 66 paisa we can ask uh, through a rti i think we should it's not justifiable but we we should also hear their side of the story why they are charging more with time would this come down further and so on yeah so it's a great question this one is a great question thank you thank you dr sunita i think next question please sakshi Shubhendu, would you like to answer this about the virtual PPA to be active? Is the possibility? Yeah. Yes. So uh, presently, uh, the virtual PPA means what? Virtual PPA means the renewable power will be selling its uh, energy in the market, and the green certificate, uh, uh, the consumer will uh, utilize that green certificate. presently we are not uh, using this model that uh, if a consumer is having a ppa with a generating station the generating station will sell its entire energy in the market and the consumer will take only the uh, your renewable credit from that plant but yes uh, discussions are being going on and near future it we will be getting actually a virtual ppa works in such an environment where we are in a energy surplus means that consumer is not taking the energy it is taking only the green attribute but here what is happening presently that consumer by taking the energy he is uh, not only consumer sorry the distribution company also not only we is uh, taking the energy from the green plants and then it is catering its demand as well as the green attributes or it is also able to cater the renewable power obligations so both they are doing presently in future if uh, it happens that we are in uh, abundant of green energy and then in that case uh, this v virtual ppa will be a popular thing thank you thank you so much I think how do how to decide in quantum of banked energy? I think it depends on the so the entity who is having the surplus energy and whatever quantum they want to bank uh, and whatever they want to utilize subsequently. That is what is the possibility because the, in the surplus situations where they have the power and they want to do the banking and how much they want to utilize in the. Uh, months or the periods where they are short of it i think they basically the decision comes from the entity who has to do the banking for the purposes for which it to, seeks to utilize the banked energy subsequently that is what is my sort of impression about so it depends on the utility itself for, or the consumer itself but if anybody any of the panelists want to supplement this i'll be more than happy to uh, be please add on if you want to anybody Uh, yes, sir. Uh, absolutely, whatever you have told is correct. So it's depending upon the requirement only. It's correct. So there's a there's a follow up question from Shubhendu on this banked energy. I think I think it was there on the screen some time ago. So Akshi, if you could uh, display that question, then maybe Shubhendu can answer that as well. Perfect methodology. Banking charges. Yeah, so uh, the banking charges uh, is the charge which, which is being taken by a distribution company for the storage of that storing that uh, renewable energy. Say for example, in the solar hour, uh, if uh, you are banking the power into the discom, when the power purchase cost in the market is lower, so it is less than three rupees in the day market, and you would like to get this power from the distribution company in the evening hours so what will happen that 
in the solar hour when the market price is low you are storing the energy in the discom and then you are taking out that power from the discom and then you are utilizing in the evening so evening the power price is very much high so it is touching rupees 10 per unit also in the dead market so in that case what will happen your banking charge will increase because no discom will take power at 3 rupees and then he will sell at 10 rupees i'm sorry uh, buy at um, when they were getting uh, power at when the, there is a low cost in the market and when the the cost in the market is higher he will procure from the market and then costlier power he will give so there is a difference between the time of uh, your uh, taking and when he's time of backing the power so that is one of the cost so if you make an arrangement in such a way that in solar hour, solar hour i will provide the power and then i will take in the solar hour only in that case you will see the banking charges are minimum but if you want would like to have a agreement with discom that i will give you in solar hour and take back in the non solar hour but you will see the banking charges are much more higher so that depends uh, when you would like to take the power in the time of day yeah. next question is um, what explains the really low uptake of long term open access compared to short term medium term consumer often blame the lack of predictability of charges retrospective actions we are seeing delaying getting nocs are prime challenges yeah i, I admit sir because in short term if you compare uh, the process is a bit streamlined in the interstate and intrastate also but when it comes to long term you have to take if you are going for an interstate between two states you have to take a no objection certificate from the sldcs or stus and that uh, also is getting delayed so uh, uh, down the line if this green energy open access portal gets popularity and then we are trying to onboard the stus also so we are, we are discussing with the stus also so that they can onboard in this portal and then through this portal if the nocs are been given for the consumers those who are taking wishing those who are willing to take for long term so in that case i think the delay will get reduced so that will be there thank you thank you shivendra thanks a lot Sakshi, next question, please. If any. I think of all, sir, these are all the questions that we have for today. Does anybody want to give any opening remarks? Sorry, closing remarks. No, I think, yeah, thank you so much. Uh, I think it's extremely useful session without any doubt. The green energy open access is relatively new. What all has happened was very well outlined by Shuvendu, but uh, and um, Engineer Tiwari and Sunita ji in regard to the corporates, what they are doing about. But extremely important questions came from the audience, the attendees. I think uh, the type of questions, the depth of questions showed very clearly that they are really sort of a thickly into the green energy open access and their questions are so important that they will certainly uh, they are keen to know about how best to sort of a make the best use of green open access what can be done on the part of the discoms or what can be done on the part in regard to the charges etc so that these open access becomes more and more sort of a uh, conducive for various uh, end uses. So I think I am extremely happy to see this. And uh, the purpose with which this uh, event was organized uh, by the forum for creating awareness and appreciation and a better understanding on the part of all concerned who are attending this, I think is really the objective has been fulfilled to a very large extent. And I think uh, as Shubindu also mentioned and Engineer Tiwari also mentioned that more and more awareness needs to be created and more such sort of a, uh, events need to be organized so that the the concerns which are there are very well flagged and I think uh, the uh, way forward can be uh, developed keeping all that in view. 
I think I'm extremely happy and thankful. And there's a lot of learning for me, particularly in regard to what is happening really in the field. And uh, I think a lot of the attendees would have learned a lot. So in closing, I would like to thank all the panelists, uh, the uh, Shubhendu Mukherjee, Engineer Tiwari, Dr. Sunita, and Sakshi uh, as our host for the event. I think thank you so much. And it has been a pleasure and it has been a good learning. And I think we look forward to taking this learning forward and doing better in the times to come. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank, Thank you, you so much, everyone. Uh, big thanks to our esteemed speakers for this wonderful session. Many thanks to our audience. With this, we have come to the end of our virtual event. Many thanks to our moderator, Mr. Saxena, for superbly managing this session. Your expertise and guidance has greatly enhanced the quality of the discussion. Our gratitude to all the speakers for taking out time from their busy schedules for this key initiative. Uh, as we conclude this event, we assure you that we will be back soon with more exciting sessions. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.